Good morning. Welcome to worship at North Madison Congregational Church. Today's the first Sunday in Lent, and we are talking about the spirituality of trees. So there is our worship tree. And we will be visiting you with it throughout the season, adding things each day. Today our theme is roots, as you will soon hear. But we're glad to have you with us, and let's settle in. Shabbat Shalom and welcome to North Madison Congregational Church. Whoever you are and wherever you are on life's journey, it is wonderful to be here with you on this sunny morning. It's a long weekend, so extra stars for everybody who came to church today. Yay. Today is the first Sunday in Lent. And so as you can see, our theme is the spirituality of trees. We're going to talk about reforesting our souls this Lent. And so each Sunday will be a different focus. So today is uh, roots, you may guess. We've got lots of roots happening up here. And um, next week, I think, is trunk, and we'll keep going from there. So uh, the worship team has been working hard on this, as has the choir. So we hope that you will find this meaningful um, and inspiring. So <clears throat> my name is Heather Arkovich. For those I have not yet met, my pronouns are she, her. I'm pastor here where we say all of our members are ministers. I'm serving this morning with Linda Giuliani, who's a little sad because her organ is sad and sick. So the organ is um, in for repairs right now, pieces of it, and uh, so it'll be all piano, which is beautiful and lovely. Um, and uh, will be great. And Bill is still well, and so Bill and Hannah are here and answering special music this morning. And uh, Carol, I think, is helping on the little cymbals, so that should be fun. Um, Mike is ushing, I think. All right, and um, our deacon this morning, I'm so not used to the mic being this loud. <laughs> so our deacon this morning is Laura, and our junior deacon is Grace, who will bring our um, gathering words. There is no children's church today, or church school, so kiddos are invited to stay in the sanctuary, and there's a prayer ground back there if you want to do that, or just be who you are where you are. It's always good. I think those are the important things that I needed to tell you, so here is Laura with our deacon's greeting. Good morning. Good morning. It is so wonderful to be here with all of you on the Sabbath morning. My name is Laura Prohaska, and my pronouns are she and her. On this first Sunday of Lent, your presence enriches our time together. I hope our worship will be meaningful and inspiring to you, and that you leave here changed and more deeply connected to your own heart, one another, and to our Creator. And here is Grace. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart, and the spirit descending, descending upon him like a dove. Let's
the beloved. With you I am well pleased. The Spirit drove him immediately into the wilderness, where he, was re where he remained for forty days, tempted by Satan. He was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. So after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent, and believe in the good news. Let us call the Spirit to us again now, to guide us to, as we, remembering Jesus, begin our religious journey to find God's voice within our hearts and within our world. Thank you, Grace. This is the time where we settle in to Sabbath time and space where we give ourselves the gift of presence and connection. And so in keeping with our tree theme and today's roots <coughs> focus, I'm going to lead us on a brief guided meditation. So I invite you to settle in. And if you feel comfortable, close your eyes or otherwise soften your gaze. Clear your hands, settle your feet on the ground. And with intentionality, just breathe in. Breathe in and out. The next breath will hold for a count of three. So breathe in, two, three, hold, two, three, and exhale, two, three. Continue breathing slowly and intentionally. And as you breathe in, you feel connected. And as you exhale, you feel your roots sink deeper and deeper into the ground. Breathing in, connection. Breathing out, sinking your roots deep into the ground. Feel how your feet are connected to the ground. Notice that connection. Notice how solid the earth is. How firmly it holds you. With your next breath in, feel your spine get a little bit longer. And as you breathe out, feel yourself sink into the ground a little bit more firmly. Breathe in, grow taller. Breathe out, sink deeper. You feel a little deeper, steadier, more connected. You are held by the strong, welcoming, rich, ground beneath you. Imagine yourself a tree. And with each breath in, your trunk grows stronger. And with each exhale, your roots sink more deeply and more deeply into the welcoming ground. Feel how connected you are as you breathe in, and breathe out. Your roots sink deeper and deeper as you breathe in and out. And now your roots begin to reach wider and wider as you breathe in and you breathe out. They sink deeper and reach wider. Now through the ends of your roots, you begin to notice that there are other roots. They are the people of your community, connecting and intertwining with the willing roots of those around you. You feel yourself reinforced and safe with other willing trees around you. 
with each breath in, you feel more connected to the ground and the support and stability of your community holding you. Your friends, your family, your neighbors, your schoolmates, your colleagues, your church members, all of the people around you connected and interwoven, creating a vast support system that keeps you grounded and rooted and strong. As you breathe in and out, it holds you up and helps you ground and grow in every breath. Your roots sink more deeply now, even still, as you breathe in and out. They reach safely into the depths of all creation. Feel the grounding sensation and deep connection as you become aware of the presence of deep, still, nourishing, vast love. As you breathe in, and out, you sink your roots into the love that is the source of all creation, the presence of God. As you feel yourself settling more and more into the sure knowledge that you are part of a vast connected web that is held in God's love as its source its strength, its sustaining. As you breathe in and out, you draw that love, the vast, endless love of the universe up through your roots and into the core of your being and know that God loves you. You are not alone. You are rooted held by God, the source of all love and life, who loves and nourishes you and welcomes your roots, holding strong to that source. Breathe in that feeling of connection and unshakable support. Breathe in that love. Relish the feeling of connection and support. When you are ready, if your eyes are still closed, gently open them. Take another deep breath in. Notice the room around you as you breathe out. And take this gift of feeling rooted and grounded in love with you into this day, through the Lenten journey, and into life. You may tap into it anytime you need it. It is for you. Sense that you are not alone. You are held and rooted in a vast, supportive web of God that holds and strengthens you. Thank you.
Hello. Good morning, good morning, good morning. So happy long weekend. Yay, no school tomorrow. That's good stuff, right? Wow, I would, I'm more excited than you are, I think. <laughs> so um, we're also in the season of, do you remember what I said the season was called? Spring. Spring, it is spring. Oh, is it spring? Equinox. Yeah. No, not yet, right? We have time still. We're getting there. It feels like we're getting there. But there's a church season that we're in right now. It's new today. Well, it started on Wednesday, Dash Wednesday. Anybody have a guess? Winter? Nope, we are in winter. It's called Lent. Lent in the church. Kind of a weird word, right? So it starts with Ash Wednesday, which is the day some of us come and get ashes on our foreheads to remember that we're, you know, human. And we, we live as long as we live, and then we go somewhere else. So, and then it was Valentine's Day this year, too. That's true. And then Lent, we remember, do you know what we do in, what we remember in Lent? We remember that um, the, it's the walk that Jesus takes as he heads toward the crucifixion. Yeah. So it's the season where we think about what happened at the end of Jesus' life. Like Christmas is the season where we think about what happened at the beginning of Jesus' life. So um, our worship team here at church comes up with a theme every year for our different seasons. And this year, you see our theme is the spirituality of trees. So we're going to have a different thing we focus on about trees each week. And today is Roots Day. You see the roots in here? Pretty cool, right? You don't usually get to see the roots of a plant because they're sunk underground. But I have these little guys that are rooting in my office, so I thought I'd bring them. Um, so what do you know about what a root does for a plant or a tree? Yes. It kind of keeps them grounded, so if they're in the storm, it's yeah. 
Yes, nice. It keeps them grounded. So if there's a storm or something, it keeps them dug in. What else do roots do? It helps them grow. It helps them grow, exactly. How does it help them grow? Roots, they get nutrients from the soil. Yeah, they get nutrients from the soil. That's right. So they like put these little finger things out into the soil, and then they suck nutrients in the soil. We do it the opposite way, right? We put the nutrients in our mouths, and then our bodies, like our digestion system sucks the nutrients out of the food we put in us. But instead, plants put their roots in the ground and suck the nutrients that way. It's like an external sucking system. We've got, <laughs> we've got an internal one. Yeah, what else do you know about roots? They ground you, they give you nutrients. This is kind of a funny question. They're also sometimes delicious. We eat roots. Yeah, a lot of the things we eat are roots, actually. Think about it. root vegetables, right? Carrots, the roots, yeah. And like, there's drinks like root beer and stuff, right? They're, they're, they can be medicinal. Roots can do lots of things. Yeah. That's why it tastes so bad, it's delicious. <laughs> well, so um, we're looking at roots as a symbol of our walk with, well, we're looking at trees as a symbol of our walk with God. What do you think roots symbolize in our faith journey? What are roots like for when we're walking with God. What do we root ourselves in? Like if you were gonna root yourself in God, what might you do? What might that mean? Go to church. Yeah, you can go to church for sure. Hopefully that would help. Yeah. What about like some things you might do in your own life, the way you are with people or with yourself? All right? It's an interesting question. You might be kind to other people. Yeah, you might be kind, you might root yourself in kindness. Yeah. You think about roots, what we draw into ourselves, like the food we put in our stomach or the things that these roots pull in. Like if you plant this in soil that's not very rich, is it going to do well? No. no. If you plant it in soil that's been poisoned, is it going to do well? No. Right. Wait, how's it going? Well, it's going to have soil soon. Yeah. Um, right now it's just getting its, what it needs from the water. Yeah, it's, it's almost ready. And um, with us, with people, if we root ourselves in friendships that are not kind, right? Does that help us grow? Not in good ways, right? If we root ourselves in meanness or unkindness <coughs> or uh, untruthfulness, anger, if we root ourselves in that stuff, is that going to help us grow in good ways? No, right? So God wants us to root ourselves in kindness, love, trust, Generosity, you know what that means? Mm -hmm. Now, be, being generous, giving things to other people with an open heart. God wants us to root ourselves in that so we grow healthy and strong and be good people and have lives that make us happy and feel meaningful. Hmm? Like, Valentine's. like Valentine's Day, yeah, yeah, exactly. Ash Wednesday was a good day for Valentine's Day this year. Or somebody said something, did you say that, Greg? Not being mean, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it really matters what we root ourselves in, how we, the people around us treat us, how we treat ourselves, how we treat other people. What we root ourselves in really has something to do with who we grow into the rest of our whole lives. So something to think about when you think about who you're hanging out with and how you're treating yourself and other people. It's important to be kind to yourself, too. Do the things that you love to do. Do you like to make art or play sports or sing or, you know, do those things that feed your soul because they help you grow right? Okay, let's pray. Dear God, thank you for all the ways that you nourish us and help us grow. Help our roots to be strong in love and kindness, courage, generosity, and all the good things that help us to be the best, most nourished versions of ourselves we can be so we can help serve the world in all the ways you need us to. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you guys. There is no church school today, I don't think, but I think, are you going downstairs? Yeah, if you want to go downstairs and hang out with Mary Ama, you can, or you can hang out up here at the playground or go sit with your folks. It's all good. Thank you for your help.
for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made a proclamation to spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey when God waited patiently in the days of Noah during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were saved through water. That was Noah's family, the eight persons. And baptism, which this prefigured, now saves you. So, hearing this, Noah had an ark in the water that helped save some people, and now you have an invitation into water through baptism to save you. Not as removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. Let the church hear what the Spirit is saying to us this morning. So when we looked at this scripture briefly, um, we didn't have Bible study this week, but um, I looked at it with a couple of groups, and um, Gail, who isn't with us today, she's just not feeling well, so boo, and hi Gail, if you watch this later. Um, Gail was like, you know, what do you do with this um, Christ suffering once for the sins of all theology? Because it is a theology in the Christian tradition, sacrificial atonement, right? <clears throat> there was Adam and Eve. There was a tree. There was fruit. Eve takes the tree. There's temptation. She takes the fruit from the tree, gives it to Adam, always gets blamed. She bit it. He bit it. For some reason, right? We, we look at blame here. Blame on Eve, Eve to give it to Adam. Blame on Adam that all of human, you know, kind to follow him is now sinful. And so now we need the Savior to come, Jesus, who ends up back at the tree, the tree of the cross, and gives his life for the lives of all to, as a sacrifice, sacrificial atonement, to make up for this thing that Adam and Eve did in the beginning. And there's a rich theology of sacrificial atonement in the Christian church and in Christian history. The progressive church, which I am deeply a part, rejects this theology wholly and roundly because we confess there's no right or wrong way here. If it has meaning to you that's life-giving, then go with it. But what we, what I profess is that Adam and Eve, maybe they were the first actual humans. I don't know how we would have that record, but maybe they were. And certainly they felt temptation in the world, as do all of us as we come from childhood to adulthood and begin to realize, oh, I have a body. Oh, look, it does things, and I'm responsible for the things it does. I have a heart. It does things. It feels things, and I am responsible for the things it feels and does. Oh, I'm an individual. I am individuated. I am not just part of the one, I'm also me. And as me, I make choices. And sometimes the choices I make hurt <clears throat> me or other people. And I influence those I love, those around me. And sometimes I influence them to do things that hurt, right? This story maybe was just the story of the first two, but in reality, it is the story of all of us, right? The story of creation is about the creation of every individual who lives on this earth, who goes from child, being cared for, running around the garden without a care in the world, where do things come from, I don't know, to adolescence. Wait a minute, how do I eat? How do I take care of myself? How do I have relationships with the people I love? It's getting warm up here all of a sudden. Power search. So, anyway. So this passage, uh, when we first read it this week, people were thinking about that part about, you know, is this really the meaning of Christ? That he suffered once for everyone. And so if we believe in our hearts and confess with our lips, as Romans says, that Jesus is our Savior, then that's it, we're saved. So it doesn't matter. For a lot of people who profess this, they say, it doesn't matter if I fall short, because Jesus has got me. Well, for me, 
The spiritual journey is about a journey. It's about deepening, sinking our roots into the experience of being human, which is the experience of participating in life and love and knowing God. So just professing something and then not trying to live it doesn't get me there, right? So what I read in this passage, more than the sacrificial atonement part, is this part that comes up a little later, which I think is more important to our Lenten journey as well. Jesus goes all the way to the cross. You talk about someone who is trying to experience what love is like. He goes so deeply and personally into love that when his friends betray him, Right? We say this, but really think about it. Like, think about a friend you've had that has betrayed you. We've all got one. You know, we've betrayed our friends and family as well. Think about someone who really hurt your feelings. Think about someone who did it publicly and really messed you up, messed up your job, messed up your role in the family, messed up a hope you had, messed up your relationship. Think about someone who really hurt you. Jesus' friends all did that to him. Most of them. And then, what does he do? Does he say, sorry, you're out. I've had enough of you. Does he go talk about them behind their backs? Oh, Peter, if I have to listen to Thomas one more time. No, he just leans into his relationships. He keeps loving them. He keeps teaching them. He keeps pulling himself away to pray about it. And there is that one instance where he comes down the mountain and says, seriously, how long do I have to put up with you idiots? He does do that. But he says it right to them. <laughs> and it's okay to express our frustration once in a while. We're human, as was he. But he takes love so seriously that when folks fall short, he says, I also am a son of humanity. And this is what love requires. We don't know exactly what happened in his young life to get him there. He lost his father, he lost his cousin, his mom calls him crazy, but he remains devoted to his community and his friends. So something rooted him in knowing the indelible importance of love. So as his friends are falling by the wayside and he's being left behind by their fear as they go to hide because they're afraid to stand with this man who now gets arrested at the end of his Lenten journey and taken into the court to be tried and they are scattered in terror, his closest disciple, the one he has poured himself into and believed in the most, stands outside the walls and says, no, I don't know this guy. Nope, no, 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 I don't know him. Close enough that maybe Jesus could overhear that. Jesus had already warned Peter, just, just so you know, Peter, you're gonna fail. You're gonna fail. <clears throat> Why did he do that? Why did he tell Peter, the cock's gonna crow, and you will have denied me three times? I think he tells Peter that because he wants Peter to be gentle with himself because he knows Peter is human because we're all human and he loves Peter. Not despite Peter's failings, but because failings are part of being a human and he loves Peter as a whole human. Imagine being loved like that. That's why people say Jesus was the Messiah. That's why people say, I must have met the Son of God. That's why people say, imagine being loved like that. Peter fails publicly, and Jesus is crucified, hung on a tree, flogged publicly, hung there <laughs> to die, and his friends depart. And what is the last thing he says? Forgive them. The last thing in his heart before it beats the last time 
His love, generosity. His heart is torn knowing how his friends will feel when he dies, and his heart is torn thinking that God may be angry with them, and so he says, God, forgive them. I love them. And forgive these soldiers, because they are no different than me. We all do things that we think are right when we are caught off guard and not rooted in love. We all get caught up in things that are wrong. Prejudices, fears, angers. It's part of being human. That's the work. The whole experiment is having these experiences of being wronged and being wrong and <clears throat> learning how to love anyway. Jesus is crucified that day, and as he prepares his body to take its last breath, as he feels his heart drawing nearer to its last beat, he says, I love you. Forgive yourselves. God, being human, is like this. Forgive them. They know not what they do. That's what our scripture says today. He went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison. That's us. Jesus made a proclamation to the spirits in prison. That's us. We are imprisoned in our humanity to believe that love isn't the way. We poo-poo it. We say, maybe later. We say, well, it's naive to put that much stock in love. We say, stand up for yourself, which you should, but do it lovingly. Not angrily. I make that mistake all the time. <laughs> we all do. The scripture says, in the days of Noah, during the building of the ark, there were a few, only eight, saved. Here's something I learned this week about the story of Noah. What's the covenant? That God will never destroy the world again, right? God forgive them? It's the rainbow. Funny thing about rainbows, I didn't know this, right? It's a bow. When you're an archer, you hold the bow this way, right? When you're going to shoot somebody. Well, if you want to make a gesture of peace, you hold your bow upward. God's rainbow is a sign in the sky that God means peace. God has taken aim before in our stories, but won't anymore. And the colors of the rainbow. We all know white is what light is, right? Light is white. All the colors are present in white. In the rainbow, they fractal out, so you see all those colors, and that's not accidental. They hold together in relationship, each color with the next, in relationship. God was angry once in the story and said, I'm not doing it that way again, and all of you live together in peace with me in this color striation because that's what love looks like. I don't know if this means God made a mistake about love early on. <laughs> Might. But it means that love is available to us always and forever. That's the story. Jesus comes not to be a sacrificial atonement once and for all, but to be a sacrificial atonement once and for all, in the sense that he did the thing so we can see how it's done. And I have to tell you something. It didn't occur to me until this year. The fact that he does this, he goes to the cross, he ends up on this tree, and he says, I love you, forgive yourselves. God, I love you, forgive them. If you love me, that is the moment when Jesus transcends. That is the moment when Jesus arrives at what? Bodhisattva-ism? We could say in another tradition, Jesus arrives, he is transformed at that point, because until that point, God had never been human, and humanity had never experienced the fullness of love. Maybe it had, but this is the record we have of a moment where it happened in his life. 
And that does change everything because now we can see it and participate in it. And that's how it works. When you have a great spiritual teacher, the energy that they contain comes into the students. When you're meditating, if you're having trouble, the teacher comes and sits near you to help ground you. We all are contained in the aura of Christ when we draw together with intention to be there. Sometimes we get to be there accidentally. The two uh, criminals that were crucified on either side of him. He said, I'll see you both in heaven today, right? Sometimes it happens accidentally, but if you want it to happen, you can happen, you can make it happen intentionally. And that's what we're hoping this walk into Lent will be. Trees are deeply rooted. We must be deeply rooted. Trees root themselves in soil. We root ourselves in love. And it's not easy to root yourself in love. There's stones in the way. There are fissures in the ground. There are places that get you stuck or distracted that roots kind of move around to cover the ground and find their way, and so must we. Be not discouraged. Love is here, calling to you, ready for you to root yourself in. And we are in Lent, a sacred season where the veil gets a little thinner, spirit draws a little nearer, Christ's presence comes a little closer. May all of ears hear. Thanks be to God. Amen. This is the time in our worship service where we respond to God with generosity. This God who is so generous to us in life and love. We offer our gifts back. Our tithes and offerings, prayers, our joys and concerns, our morning offering will now be received. And our choir will offer us another song about being rooted and grounded in love.
And now this is a special time during our service when we speak aloud the prayer requests from those among us. I will read the joys first. <coughs> Even though I tripped and fell last eve and hit my eye, it could have been worse. My eye is purple now, just in time for Lent. I hope it doesn't last 40 days. It's <laughs> from Linda. Purple is one of my favorite colors. <laughs> a joy for Roberta and Peter M. who lead us in feeding a record number of homeless at Columbus House yesterday. A blessing for some folks that sleep outside this time of year. Amen. And now some concerns. Prayers for my brother Paul, who will be having open heart surgery tomorrow in Illinois for a 90% blockage of his heart. May God guide the surgeon's hands and his recovery and rehab go smoothly. Prayers for those among us who are experiencing health challenges, that you feel the love of community around you. Prayers for Dick Pryor's rapidly, rapid recovery from England. <clears throat> My dad passed this morning. Prayers from Chris Jennings. <clears throat> Please join me in a minute of silent prayer as we lift up the joys and concerns that were shared this morning, as well as those that are unspoken in our hearts. Continue in prayer. <laughs> Only one life is short. It's so easy for us to get distracted by many things and lose the preciousness of the days. So as we step into this Lenten journey, let us be grateful that we are still here to be stepping. Let us hold in our hearts and memories all those on whose shoulders we stand. <coughs> the ones close in our families that we have lost, our teachers, the teachers of our teachers, the clergy and churches that have shaped us, our four parents in this church community, and all those who have passed on this story of love, healing, justice, tenacity, transformation, standing up for the underdog, believing in the unbelievable, holding space for miracles. We bless the people who have passed that on to us all the way back to Jesus himself, and those he knew and taught, and those who knew and taught him. And on the human lineage from which he came. We are all so connected. We all share this experience. And there's so much wisdom that we could share, and so often instead we share fear, anger, resistance, resentment, disconnect, and then we wonder why we're not happy. So help us today, God, as we step into this wilderness journey to reforest ourselves, remembering the depth and breadth of our connections and drawing on them shamelessly and confidently and joyously with gratitude and courage. And as we continue on our journey, strengthen us and soften us. Open us and shore us up so that each day we do have, whether we get 40 or one more, whether we stumble a few times and hurt ourselves or whether we sail through, help us along the way become 
more and more awakened to your presence within us, around us, among us, driving us into the wilderness of our lives in the same way that the Spirit drove Jesus, the same Spirit that let him know he was beloved, and then drove him to deepen that experience in the wilderness with wild beasts around him and temptation coming to call, the angels tending him, and the spirit of love and life alive, enlightening his soul. Help us to do as he did and deepen ourselves in that sure knowledge and presence so that we too might come to a point of transfiguration, glowing, glowing with love. And as we continue into this journey of life, hold all these prayers that we have lifted up in your heart, God. And all those for whom we have not prayed, including ourselves, you know what it is we all need. You know what it is that the world needs. So we unite our hearts, we intertwine our roots, and we send the nutrients of our prayers down into the earth back to you, source, to be redistributed in all the places that most need it right now, the war-torn places, the broken places, the ravaged places, the imprisoned places, the hospitalized places, all the places, to amplify the joy and healing, to soften the hurt, to release the fear, to welcome the growth and to be part of it. <coughs> and we pray together the prayer your son taught, translated by the New Zealand Christians in their prayer book, Eternal Spirit, Earth Maker, Pain Bearer, Life Giver, Source of all that is and that shall be, Father and Mother of us all, Loving God in the room is heaven, the howling of your name echoes through the universe. The way of justice be followed by the peoples of the earth. Your heavenly will be done by all created beings. Your commonwealth of peace and freedom sustain our hope and come on earth. With the bread we need for today, feed us. In the hurts we absorb from one another, forgive us. In times of temptation and test, spare us. From the grip of all that is evil, free us. For we reign in the glory of the power that is love, now and forever. Amen. And now we'll all sing in response the song the choir taught us this morning. The roots are in your bulletin. <laughs> Sometimes our kids are the ones who have the most creative ideas. So stay for a little bit, it won't be long, but we just want to do some brainstorming and then we will do some other extensions of that as we move along. March 3rd, not next week. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Two weeks. Two weeks? Two weeks? Two weeks? Yeah. I've lost a week somewhere. Sorry. March 3rd. March 3rd. And if you were watching,
launching at home, you can send your messages to the office and we'll incorporate them. Thank you. Couple more announcements. You should treat yourself this first Sunday in Lent to Linda's weekly musings. The link is in the weekly um, email that you get. It provides scripture and context to the music for our Lenten theme, which is re reforesting our souls, the spiritual teaching of trees. Uh, regarding the youth group rockathon that was to take place last night, unfortunately, we needed to cancel this event due to too many scheduling conflicts for our senior youth group members. If you indicated your support in a donations or pledge, we will reach out to you directly. Please stay tuned for future opportunities to support our youth group mission efforts. And Peter Meyer would like to remind you that this Tuesday, February 20th, in Friendship Hall at 4.30 p.m., they will be discussing Paul Calanthini's When Breath Becomes Air. And if you have any questions, please see Peter. Thank you. Well, thank you all. And as you go off into this day, we hope you will stop first in Friendship Hall for our coffee hour, otherwise known as happy hour, which is sponsored by Cal and Nora today. So thanks to them. And, um, <laughs> and the art show is still up for your enjoyment. And uh, we hope you'll buy your grocery cards because we get a kickback. So it's like free money for the church and it helps the store support the community. So buy your grocery cards. And remember that life is short and we don't have much time to gladden the hearts of those who make this journey with us so be swift to love and make haste to be kind and may the god who made us and who loves us and who makes this journey with us be with us all now and forever amen and shalom <laughs>